Hello, everyone. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. I am Justin Essary, Associate Professor of Politics and International Affairs here at Wake Forest University. The IMC is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Wake Forest University and previously sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speakers are Matthew Tyler of Stanford University and Arthur Ziang Yu of the University of Chicago. We are hosting a special series of presentations that were originally slated for the 2020 annual meeting of the Midwest Political Science Association that was canceled due to the outbreak of COVID-19. So for these special sessions, uh, each uh, session will host two talks lasting 20 to 25 minutes each, uh, followed by uh, a 10 to 20 minute, uh, depending on how long things last, Q&A session. Uh, you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window, and you can ask a question at any time during the talk, but all questions will be held until the end of the presentation. A uh, link to each presenter's slideshow will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window so that you may refer to it throughout the presentation, and I'll post those links uh, just, as we, uh, just after we get started. Our first presentation will be from Matthew Tyler of Stanford University, and he's presenting a talk entitled uh, Getting More Out of Human Coders with Statistical Models. Matt, thanks for being here today. Uh, thanks for having me, Justin. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, so I'll start. Uh, this project uh, is all about uh, trying to uh, extract more information from human coders. So uh, let's just go uh, right into the sort of motivating substantive uh, example here. So uh, this work is at least part inspired by the, this, this research question. So how different are the contents of uh, pro-democratic and pro-Republican news articles? So the answer to this question has a lot of ramifications, especially if we are worried about uh, the magnitude of selective exposure and, and media polarization. So uh, if we think that uh, Democrats and Republicans are getting their news from a lot of different sources and, and they're opting into uh, reading news articles that have pro-democratic or pro-republican uh, slants uh, that we might be worried that those uh, news articles are just talking about completely different things and then we might end up with um, you know a divided population where some people are reading about this these news events uh, maybe uh, more about like the COVID virus uh, and this group uh, maybe reading less about the virus for example. Um, and so in order to answer this question, we first have to identify uh, what are the pro-democratic and pro-Republican news articles. So uh, one way to do this is to have human coders label articles. And so uh, this, the data set that I'm using uh, throughout this paper is, uh, comes from a forthcoming paper uh, by Peterson et al. And they collected a corpus of about uh, 50,000 uh, political news articles from the 2016 election. So here's an example of one on the right talking about the, the horse race in uh, the Virginia. Uh, and so they recruited about 605 coders from Mechanical Turk and they randomly assigned these coders uh, to code articles and they had them code these articles as either pro-democratic, neutral, or pro-republican. And our, our sort of substantive goal here is just to estimate the relationship between the content of an article and the article slant. Uh, so we want to know if those pro-democratic articles are talking about the same thing as pro-republican articles. Uh, and this uh, this particular data set has, has sort of a feature that's common to a lot of hand-coded data sets in political science is that the, the vast majority of articles are, are only labeled by one coder. So we're only able to, for the vast majority of cases, we're only able to learn uh, about the true category or the true label of the article from just one, from one coder at a time. Um, so I, I view this uh, sort of standard practice in political science for, for, for a task like this is, is, is very similar structure. Uh, so most objects, like I said, uh, are only, only get one label from one coder. Uh, however, there are some objects uh, that receive multiple labels and those uh, that's done on purpose. It's intentional in order uh, usually uh, to compute some measure of coder agreement, uh, also called intercoder reliability. So these, these are things like Cronbox Alpha, uh, uh, Krippendorf's uh, Kappa or Alpha, I can't remember the Greek letter for that one, but uh, Krippendorf has, has one or two. 
Uh, and the idea is that we're going to uh, trust the coders or we're going to we're going to follow the labels provided by the coders uh, once we see uh, those coders reach an agreement threshold. And then we're often we're going to reiterate uh, our coding scheme or revise our code book or retrain our coders and, until we meet that, that threshold. And so a common one uh, people are using complex alpha is to go with uh, with point seven. Uh, okay, so this uh, this talk is about coding practice, and uh, I put up a slide called standard coding practice. So obviously, I'm going to talk about the problems now, or at least the problems I see with this approach. Uh, so, so one problem uh, that we just can't really escape from is that that coders err. So some coders are more motivated, uh, either because they have more financial incentives or they have more intellectual investment in the project, uh, while other coders are. are uh, especially uh, like me when I was an undergrad, we're only, only really just trying to get by and it didn't put that much effort into reading the articles. Uh, the problem when, when coders make mistakes or they, they make errors, either intentionally or unintentionally, is that this induces measurement error. Measurement error. And that measurement error is gonna be on both sides of, uh, of these reliability thresholds. Uh, regardless of whether or not your, your reliability hits 0.7 or whatnot, uh, there's always going to be some amount of measurement error uh, when we're when we're trusting these coders, uh, and this measurement error is a problem because uh, this is going to bias uh, our analyses. So, if for example we just want to know how many articles uh, or what proportion of articles are pro democratic or what proportion of articles are pro republican, uh, then the measurement error induced by trusting these um, error prone coders will lead us uh, will will cause these uh, proportion estimates to become biased. Uh, in possibly unknown directions. Additionally, uh, if we want to use these coder labels in regressions, either as independent or dependent variables, uh, the measurement error also induces uh, a bias there. And so I'll show you uh, in this uh, election news article case that there's a pretty substantial bias when we just trust the coder labels from, when those, coder, when, from those coders that were recruited from MTurk. All right, so what do I propose we do about it? So, so sort of the... the, the uh, Sort of the, the, the idea behind this talk is let's uh, treat coder labels, uh, the labels that the coders give us, as just uh, noisy signals of the true label. Uh, that is, we acknowledge that there is some error in what the coders tell us, and, and we're going to try and extract the true label from that noise. Uh, moreover, we're going to use statistical models to identify uh, which coders are uh, more error prone than others. I'm going to talk a lot about how the models are going to do that. It might seem like black magic at first. How do we know? How would we? How could we possibly know which coders are more accurate? But basically, the idea is that um, when coders agree a lot, uh, they're more likely to be accurate. And so we're going to identify the more the more competent or the more accurate coders uh, based on once the coders that are more often in a, in a majority. Uh, and so once we have this model, uh, the model will will give us a uh, prediction of the true label given the coder labels. Uh, just, and uh, the, the nice thing is if we have a model that's accounting for the fact that some coders are more competent and more accurate than others, then this prediction uh, will reflect that. And so we will favor the input from the more accurate, more competent, more motivated coders. The nice thing about all this is that uh, these predictions, the expected value of the true level given the coder labels, I mean, uh, these are avoid the measurement error problems that I was referring to earlier. And so they make much better independent and dependent variables uh, in regressions or when we're estimating the categories uh, than just the raw, the raw labels from the coders. And we'll see that in the example uh, towards the end of the, the talk with some, with some real numbers. Okay. So, here are some flowcharts uh, just to clarify what, uh, how I want to change coding practice. So here's what I'm calling sort of the, the old workflow or the, the, the trust workflow uh, where we trust the coder labels. So there's, uh, the, in the beginning, uh, we, we have coders label news articles. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we, we take those articles that are coded by multiple coders. And we calculate the intercoder reliability if it meets a certain threshold, then um, we're happy and we move on. We, we analyze those raw labels as if they're the true labels. That's the, that's the trust part of this trust workflow. Uh, if the threshold isn't met, then it's very common to uh, refine the coding process, either adjust the code book to make things clear or retrain the coders to make them understand 
uh, that these disagreements aren't aren't justified and and, and the coders should agree. With, uh, some coders are, are correct. Okay, so that's the old workflow. I I don't want to change this uh, this part of the workflow where people refine the coding process. Uh, I just want to add a, add a few steps at the end. So so people should definitely continue to calculate. Uh, intercoder reliability and refine the coding process until they get a reliability score that they're happy with, that they think makes sense for the problem at hand. Uh, all I want to do is I want to replace the part where coder labels are, are analyzed, uh, the raw coder labels are analyzed, and I just want to add a model fitting step at the end, and I, and I want um, to uh, take the results of that model, take the predictions from that model of the true label and analyze those instead. So that's, that's really the, the contribution uh, I want to make here. So uh, why do models work? What's, what's, why can models do all these things? So the key idea or the core idea behind models here is that models uh, give us a way to convert coder agreement, the, this intercoder reliability, uh, and turn it into coder accuracy, uh, provided we make a set of, a set of assumptions. Uh, and so what the, the principle this is based on is that when two coders agree, they are either both right or both wrong. There's no, there's no way to get around that. Uh, and so when we, when we pair that with some simplifying assumptions, so here in this case, uh, we're going to suppose there are only two cat coders are placing objects in two categories. They're just two coders. Uh, the coders are homogeneous, so they have the same accuracy, and the coders are making independent decisions. We combine all these simplifying assumptions. Uh, then we're going to get a nice equation here that relates agreement to accuracy. And so just taking this sentence up to here, when two coders agree, they're either both right or both wrong. That means that the coder agreement rate is equal to the probability that they're both right, coder accuracy squared, uh, plus the probability that they're both wrong. Uh, so that's the square of one minus coder accuracy. Okay. And so uh, this is an equation that, uh, that basically gives us a one-to-one -one mapping between coder agreement rate and coder accuracy. So for example, uh, if we observe that our coders agree at the rate of 75%, that means that uh, when we plug that into this equation here, then uh, we find that that is consistent with a coder accuracy rate of 85%. Um, moving forward, I'm gonna, I'll relax some of the assumptions because we might not like the coders are, have the same accuracy. Uh, but the, this core idea that uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between coder agreement, coder accuracy is, is going to stay in place. And that's what we're, we're always going to be using that to uh, identify the model. OK, so uh, this next slide here, I'm going to walk through a more complex model where we relax some of the, some of the assumptions. Uh, and this is uh, what I'm calling the coder competence estimation model. And it's, it's uh, an extension of a model in computational linguistics, and I'll clarify. Uh, what the extension is uh, below. Uh, but the just to get us started on the notation here, and I promise there won't be that much notation, it's just, just on this one slide. Uh, the true label here uh, is going to be note, noted uh, by ZI, and it's just drawn from a, from a categorical distribution here. So there's some proportion vector lambda, and these are just the probabilities that an article is either actually pro-democratic, actually neutral, or, or actually pro-republican. Uh, and then we're going to assume that uh, each coder has a, has a competency parameter between zero and one. And the idea is that uh, the uh, coders with a higher competency are gonna be more accurate. So with competency closer to one, the more accurate you are, and the more likely the coder is to give us the correct answer. And then each coder will also have a guessing parameter. And this is what the coder, uh, this is a proportion vector, and this is uh, basically what the coder is going to say when they're guessing. So they're gonna guess uh, that it's either pro-democratic, pro, -democratic, pro uh, pro-Republican or neutral based on this guessing parameter when they're guessing. And this is, uh, this is the part that, that is different from the, the MACE model from computational linguistics. They just assume it's, it's drawn from the uniform distribution. Okay, and then uh, now we're gonna, we're gonna see how the, the coder label is a noisy signal of the true label. So uh, every time uh, an article, article I is coded by coder J, uh, it's gonna be drawn from a distribution like this. So, uh, First, we're going to draw uh, what I'm calling the signal variable SIJ down here uh, from the from a coin a weighted coin flip based on the competency of coder J. So, the more competent coder J is, the more likely SIJ is to be one. Uh, 
Okay, so what is what what good is is it uh, when when Sij is one? Uh, when Sij is one uh, and the true label is k, uh, that means that the coder is just going to be correct. So it's drawing from a categorical here with the 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 k basis vector. Uh, all I mean here is that when Sij is one. Uh, then the coder will return, will give us the true label. So the coder is automatically correct. Uh, when SIJ is zero, then it doesn't matter what the true label is. The coder is just going to guess with this constant rate uh, this, due to this guessing parameter GJ. Uh, so in short, if SIJ is one, the coder gives us, provides us the correct label. Otherwise, the coder is guessing. Right? So the, the competency parameter just controls how often they're guessing versus not. Okay, so one, one direct implication of all this is that when coders are correct, when you have multiple coders coding the same article uh, and, and we know they're all correct, then that means they are agreeing, right? There's no, there's no other way about it. Uh, and therefore we can infer that uh, more competent coders agree with their peers more frequently, right? Because agreement, it's much more likely when coders are agreeing. So coders who are uh, usually in a majority, a majority of their peers when, when coders are coding the same object, those coders are going to be uh, what the model identifies the more competent coders. Uh, and in the, in the paper, I, I extend the model a little bit further to smooth over coders uh, because there might not be enough information to estimate uh, these quantities for each coder. Uh, and I provide some, some identification results. But let's, uh, let's move on to just applying, applying this to the, to the news article data. So let's, we're gonna apply the CC model just described to the news article data. Um, so recall our goal is to categorize articles as either pro-democratic, neutral, or pro-republican. And uh, our goal is to estimate the relationship between news content and slam. So uh, Ultimately, we're going to regress some measure of the news content uh, on these uh, predicted categories of pro-democratic, neutral, or pro-republican to find out how the categories affect uh, the content of, of the news articles. And the content in particular here that we're mentioning, just whether or not they talk about uh, a politician. Um, so the plan uh, from here on out is I'm going to take the, C the I'm going to take the data. I'm going to run it into the CCU model. I'm just going to fit it with an EM algorithm. Uh, I'll talk about that in the paper. Uh, and then we're going to take the predictions, the predicted slant from the CC model, because the model is going to return to us the, the, the prediction of the true label, given the coder labels. And we're going to regress uh, the content of the articles or the counts of how many times they mentioned certain politicians on, on the predicted slant. All right, so this figure here is the, uh, this is after I've run the model and I'm showing you the distribution of those CJ parameters, the distribution of the coder, the coder competency parameters. Okay, so remember coder competency runs between zero and one with one uh, with, you know, a higher competency indicating a more accurate coder. Uh, and so these coders were not particularly uh, motivated or, or uh, they were, or let's just say they were, they were uh, pretty likely to make mistakes. So, or to guess. So the average competency here is about uh, 37, uh, 0.37 here, uh, which is, uh, means that they are guessing more than half the time, the average coder, the average coder guessing more than half the time. Okay, so, uh, but what, the key thing to note here is that there's actually quite a bit of variance in the coder competency. So we have some coders over here who are basically guessing all the time, these coders in the left-hand tail. But then we have some coders here in the right-hand tail and they're, they're getting the, the, they're revealing the true label to us, you know, three quarters of the time, okay? Uh, and so when what we're going to see going forward is that the, the, when the model gives us these predictions, it's going to, it's going to weight the prediction towards the coders that are, more, that it has identified are more competent or more accurate. So let's just see this in, in action. So here are just some example, uh, example article headlines and, and how the coders voted and what the model says. So just some straightforward examples first. Um, so this is, this is some, this is an article that all the coders, all, all the coders you saw, I thought was pro democratic. So Donald Trump's many business failures explained. Uh, here's an article that all the coders agreed was was pro-Republican. I looked at Democrat and Hillary Clinton campaign staffer uh, in all caps sent to prison exclamation point. Um, so in both these cases, the model said that the predicted probability of it being the category pro-Democratic and pro-Republican respectively was 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 basically you know 100%. Uh, but here's a more contentious example. At least it was contentious for the coders. So the headline says Donald Trump says soldiers with PTSD aren't that strong. 
So the coders, there were only two for this article. The coders voted, uh, one coder voted one pro-democratic, uh, one co and then one coder voted pro-republican. Okay, so uh, it, it's not clear uh, without any way to adjudicate between the coders what we should think. We might even take away that this is maybe even a neutral article if we were sort of average the coders together. Uh, but the model says, no, wait on a second. This is, uh, I'm pretty sure with a 60% probability that this is a pro-democratic article. Uh, and it's a neutral article with probability uh, 36%, with about, uh, if I'm reading it right, 3% for, for pro-Republican. So what's going on here? Why is, why is the coder that voted pro-Republican being overruled? And why is the coder who voted pro-democratic uh, for this article uh, being favored so much by the model? Uh, well, if we look at the competencies of the coders, we see that the pro-democratic coder competency was about 0.38, which is a which is just a smidge above average. But the pro-republican coder competency is 0.12. This coder is is basically guessing 90% of the time. So the model basically throws out the the coder that voted pro-republican because their their labels are not that trustworthy. The pro-democratic coder, the coder who voted pro-democratic is, is slightly more trustworthy and therefore the model, model favors their label uh, a lot more when, when forming the prediction. Uh, and so hopefully you've sort of taken away from these examples that the, these predictions are, are capturing uncertainty. So it's not 100% pro-democratic here because we only, we only get like one, one good coder label, uh, uh, but it does favor the more competent coder. Okay, and so now let's uh, let's run that regression I've been talking I've been referring to. And so here, uh, and and there's a lot of numbers on here, so hopefully we can we can take this slow. Uh, here, uh, each column of this table is, uh, corresponds to a different regression. Uh, the columns one and two, the dependent variable is whether or not the headline mentions Trump, so just an indicator of whether or not it mentions Trump. And in columns three and four, the dependent variable is whether or not the headline mentions Hillary Clinton. Uh, in fact, just whether or not mentions Clinton at all. So I guess it could refer to uh, either Trump's or Clinton's uh, family members or people who share the last name. Uh, the the difference between the, otherwise the difference between these columns is that columns one and three use this sort of trust approach, where the the or the more the standard coding practice uh, as it stands now, where we uh, we just trust what the coders say. And then columns three and, or columns two and four use the the model based uh, predictions I'm talking about that we've been that I you know uses the coder competency estimation model. Uh, and then the the independent variables here are um, whether or not the coder is labeled as pro Republican, neutral, and then the intercept here is just the, the, the baseline category which is which is pro democratic. Uh, and so if we just zoom in here on this top row, uh, what we see is how the uh, estimates change depending on whether or not you use the, the sort of, whether or not you trust the raw coder labels or whether or not you use a prediction. Uh, and because the, uh, because the, the sort of trust the, trust the raw coder labels approach uh, has so much measurement error and the, the prediction based approach doesn't, uh, the, the coefficients are quite different. In fact, the prediction, uh, the model based prediction approach finds a coefficient that's uh, two or three times larger uh, than the, the model base or the, uh, the trust the raw coder labels approach. And then similarly uh, for the, the, the Clinton uh, difference between pro-democratic and pro-republican articles, uh, the, uh, the model based prediction estimates are, are also much lot larger because they're uh, not attenuated by the same amount of measurement error. Uh, if we go down here to the difference between pro-democratic and neutral articles, uh, we see uh, a, basically a similar story. The uh, difference between uh, pro-democratic and neutral sources is pretty severely attenuated in the trust raw coder labels approach, whereas in uh, for both Trump and Clinton. In fact, for the, uh, the Clinton example, the trust the raw coder labels approach uh, has a different sign than the model-based prediction approach. Okay, so why, why are these estimates so different? Why do you get such radically different answers? Uh, well, it's for the reasons more or less that I, I've, I've, uh, I've said, but this figure shows it a bit more explicitly. So here I'm plotting, I'm showing you on the vertical axis, the hat values, that is the leverage of a, of a news article on the, the model-based prediction regression estimates. So when we use the predictions, what's the leverage of an article here? 
And then the horizontal axis shows you the average coder's competency for that article. And so what we're seeing here is that when the average coder competency, the coders who coded that article goes up, the leverage of that point on the regression also shoots up. And this is on the log scale. So this is, a, this is actually like an exponential, exponential growth here. Um, so the, the articles that are coded by the more competent coders are given you know, exponentially more weight than the, the articles coded by the, the coders who are basically guessing all the time. Okay? And so that's why the, the differences are, are so stark between the, uh, this sort of trust the raw coder labels approach and the model-based prediction approach. Uh, this relationship is flat for the uh, for the for the just if we just use the raw coder labels because there's no uh, that model doesn't differentiate between coders because it doesn't estimate which coders are more competent. Okay, so uh, my time's almost up, so I need to wrap wrap up here. Uh, the uh, as I've as I've uh, so summarized what I've been talking about, the standard coding practice uh, it trusts the wrong coders too much, basically because it trusts it trusts all coders equally and and. Uh, as we've seen, it's not it's not reasonable to uh, treat all you know coders as homogeneous. Uh, just looking at reliability alone is insufficient because reliability can only really tell you about the average competency of the coders. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity there, and then also you know just taking reliability and then trusting the coders doesn't account for the the measurement error as we've seen. Uh, I, I beat myself to the punch there with that line. Uh, Models have this nice feature where they're they're elevating the competent coders, like as we've seen by by uh, by weighting the comp more competent coders or favoring the labels from the more competent coders, and then they're simultaneously adjusting for the uncertainty by not going all the way uh, just because a coder said it was pro democratic or pro republican. It's it's uh, somewhat held back by the uncertainty and the fact that there's noise in the in the coder signals. And then as we've seen, if we are, uh, when we replace the raw coder labels with predictions, we can remove some regression biases and, and we'll, we'll actually uh, um, find answers that uh, accord a bit more with, with what we think. We, we would naturally think that um, pro-democratic and pro-Republican news articles be, would be more likely or uh, would talk about the opposing candidates uh, in, at different rates. Okay, uh, so I think that's it for me. Uh, I'm including my uh, my website and my Twitter here. Uh, I only post paper, my, my papers on Twitter, so you're safe to follow me to to learn about the upcoming paper. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to to Justin. Thanks a lot, Matt, for that presentation. Uh, I now want to introduce our second presenter. Our second presentation will be from Arthur Ziang Yu of the University of Chicago, presenting a talk entitled. Beyond late identification of ATEs of always takers and never takers. Great. Can I start now? Yep, you're good to go. Okay. So, so this is Arthur. I'm a PhD student from U Chicago Power Science Department. Uh, this is a joint work with Professor Bobby Gaudi, and uh, he works on. Uh, IP and political methodology. In this paper, we will talk about how to use instrumental variable to learn the ATEs of always takers and never takers. So, IV estimation has been widely used in empirical political science studies to address endogeneity problem. And in the presence of heterogeneous treatment, in fact, under certain assumptions, IV only identifies late uh, local average treatment defect, which is an ATE for the compilers whose treatment taking decisions can be shifted by the instrument. And because of the uh, ca causal heterogeneity, late usually doesn't equal to ATE. This is also true that late doesn't equal to uh, ATEs of always takers and never takers. So we believe that in the study of uh, persuasion, researchers are interested in the ATEs of always takers and never takers. So in empirical study of persuasion, people are interested in the following target parameter. So the effect of some information treatment on people's action of interest. So I'm going to give you two examples. So in authoritarian country, authoritarian government will use propaganda to persuade its people to believe in its performance. And uh, to study this, researchers may ask the following question. What is the effect of this authoritarian government's propaganda on people's belief of regime performance? And uh, in democratic country, the election candidates May use, may use campaigns to persuade voters to vote for them. And researchers are asking questions like, 
uh, what is the effect of watching Fox News on people's tendency of uh, voting for Republican Party candidates? And uh, in the empirical study of persuasion, the, a very popular design is that people, researchers are finding some exogenous variation on the uh, information access, and uh, they also allow non-compliance in their research design. But such non-compliance, we argue, that may reflect rich information on the people's uh, private knowledge uh, on the potential gains uh, from the treatment. Uh, and uh, we believe that there may be very uh, uh, heterogeneous treatment effect among uh, always takers and never takers. And we argue that always takers, they may be most responsive to the information treatment because, because uh, they are the, because of their high supplier of the state of the world, and for never takers, maybe the least responsive because of their low state uh, prior of the state of the world. And in this paper, we will do four things. So to facilitate our extrapolation exercise, we first rephrase everything in the Invens and Ungrist IV model into the latent utility framework. And uh, after this rephrasing exercise, we will provide a set of point and partial identification results of the ATs of always takers and never takers. We also conduct a simulation study to illustrate the identification results, but I will not go through uh, these results due to the time constraint. And we also uh, revisit visit this current and high mirror 2009 brutal analysis paper and do some extrapolation exercise. So first, um, let's recall the uh, Inbens and Ungrist IV model. So in their framework, they assume very flexible heterogeneity of the treatment effect. And uh, to use IV to learn some meaningful uh, causal quantity, we need four assumptions. IV exogeneity, exclusion restriction, and IV relevance. And in addition, you'll need these monotonicity conditions. And then world estimates can uh, identify the ATEs for compliers. Um, so after they published the paper, there are so many criticisms on this paper. Uh, especially from Jane Heckman. So he has particularly has two criticisms on the on this framework. So first, the, the monotonicity assumption uh, in the I, uh, IV model is a little bit ambiguous. To be precise, what I mean is that the monotonicity assumption doesn't equal to mathematical monotonicity. So to illustrate my point, let's consider this uh, example where Z, the instrument, can take three values. So suppose Z can take uh, 0, 1, or 2. So mathematical monotonicity, monotonicity may imply a dz smaller than d1 and smaller than d2. Of course, you can reverse the order. But the IV monotonicity actually says for any z and z prime in the support of z, uh, you either have dz smaller than dz prime or dz prime smaller than dz, uh, which holds almost surely. So because of this, uh, this ordering of potential outcome uh, potential treatment status fits the IV monotonicity. So D0 smaller than D1 and D0 smaller than D2 and D2 smaller than D1. But of course, if you look at this line, uh, the potential treatment status doesn't weakly increasing or decrease, uh, decreasing in the, uh, in the value of the instrument. So to summarize, the mathematical monotonicity implies IV mon monotonicity, but not the vice versa. And the second criticism is that the monotonicity conditions doesn't have very uh, clear substantive interpretation. To be precise, what I mean is that there is no natural connection between monotonicity and the rational choice theory. So, and also if you think about, look at the framework, the assumptions in, within the Inbens and Angris IV model is a little bit asymmetric. Um, so let me illustrate my point now. So in the outcome stage, they allow very flexible heterogeneity in the treatment effect. But in the selection stage, where you, you are using instruments to shift people's tendencies of taking, uh, selecting into treatment or not, uh, they are imposing uh, this uniformity assumption, that is, IV, your instrument, only shift people's decisions in one direction. That is, you either increase people's tendency of taking the treatment or decrease the people's tendency of treatment. So because of this, uh, Jane Heckman suggests us to use uh, uniformity instead of monotonicity to uh, 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 describe uh, this assumption. So to, to resolve those two criti criticisms, so Wittloso, uh, in 2002, he has a paper that linked the IV model to the selection equation approach proposed, uh, developed by um, Heckman. So now let's rephrase everything 
the IV model, inverse and ingress IV model into the latent utility framework. Okay, so it turns out the monotonicity condition can be rewritten as this uh, selection equation, uh, D equals to indicator function of VZ uh, minus U greater or equal than zero. So Z is our instrument and V is some functions that researchers don't know, we need to learn from the data and U is the latent utility. So after you define all the terms, uh, so the intuition of this selection equation is that you are using instrument to shift people's valuation of selecting into the treatment. And uh, then people are making decisions on selecting into the treatment given the exogenously set value, exogenously set uh, instrument, okay? And because of the selection equation, the independence assumption can be formulated as the instrument is independent of the joint distribution of potential outcomes and the latent utility. And uh, it is worth repeating, it is worth emphasizing that the latent utility is something that we analysts do not observe um, directly. And uh, the first, uh, the IV relevance assumption basically says that the function VZ cannot be a constant, and Z, in other words, Z actually shifts people's decisions of uh, uh, selecting to a treatment or not. And the exclusion restriction assumption remains the same. So Z only ha uh, occurs in the uh, selection stage, but not in the outcome stage. And we also need this uh, technical assumption where U is to be continuously distributed. So because of that framework, uh, which is based on the latent utility, we can now define this whole new treatment effect parameter called marginal treatment effect, i.e. MTE. So before we define MTE, I will do some normalization. Uh, so because we assume, remember that we assume U is dis continuously distributed. And this implies that we can, we can normalize the distribution of U to a uh, uniform distribution. And this normalization has a, a very important uh, implication that is after this normalization, the function VZ in the selection equation exactly equals propensity score. And uh, when big U equals to little u, which, are which is a realization of big U equals to VZ, when this event happens, this exactly describes the individuals who are at the margin of selecting into, into the treatment. And uh, based on this, we define the marginal treatment effect at this function. Intuitively, substantively speaking, this is an average treatment effect for the individuals who are the margin of selecting into, into the treatment. Of course, uh, this is very different from the uh, conditional average treatment effect that you will often see in machine learning and causal inference literature because the conditional average treatment effect, uh, this, this literature, they are describing the uh, treatment effect heterogeneity with respect to some observed characteristics, covariates. But here, the MTE describes the uh, treatment effect with respect to latent utilities. And remember that we don't observe latent utilities. And MTE is actually a very powerful framework because many classic treatment effect parameters are weighted average of MTE. And this weight reflects that different estimates uh, puts different weights on different types of individuals within your data, okay? And uh, because we, after we have this set up, we can talk about our identification. So remember that our two target parameters are the ATs of always takers and never takers. And uh, from this Inbens and Rubin paper, so the Y1, the distribution of Y1 for always takers and distribution of Y0 for never takers are identifiable. So we actually only need to identify the expectation of Y0 for, uh, for always takers and expectation of Y1 for never takers. And uh, remember, we also have this uh, marginal treatment effect framework. So a natural question to ask, our, to ask is that, can we rewrite everything into the uh, weighted average of treat, uh, can we rewrite the two target parameters into weighted average of MTE function? It turns out that we can. And this is the theorem. Theorem. So, 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 and uh, so now we can rewrite everything into the weighted average uh, of MTE function. And the weights are just propensity scores, right? For all takers, the weights are P0, which is defined as probability of D equals to one given Z equals zero. And for never takers, the weight is this one minus one, uh, one minus P1, so which equals to, where P1 is uh, probability of D equals to one, given Z is one, okay? 
So now, uh, given these two results, we can ask ourselves, what we don't know is that is this MTE function. And uh, what if we can put some parametric assumptions on this MTE function? And can we point identify this MTE function with this parametric assumption? And actually, it turns out that we can. This assumption basically says that we can either assume this MT function is linear or quadratic, or any uh, or more flexible uh, in, uh, by by uh, by adding more polynomials in the in the in the functions. And uh, and uh, and if our instrument induces enough variation on the treatment taking decisions, and then we can point identify this MT function because we can point identify this. We can point and identify our two target parameters. And this exactly summarizes, this intuition is exactly summarized in this proposition. And of course, because we know the MTE function and all the classic target parameters, J, uh, or, uh, 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 selection on the gains, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can be point identified, okay? But after we prove this proposition, there will the a natural criticism. There are two natural criticisms. So first, so people may say, okay, why do I believe in this strong parametric assumption, right? So people may disagree with each other on this. And also, if you think about these parametric assumptions, it's conceptually strange, because the motivation of the marginal treatment effect is that you want to allow very flexible treatment effect with respect to the latent utility, which is the observable. But this parametric assumption. Uh, is actually restricting such flux treatment effect heterogeneity. So to respond to these criticisms, we are asking ourselves, can we do partial identification? In terms of partial identification, what I mean is that can we construct a bound on the ATEs of always takers and ever takers? And it turns out that we can. And uh, our partial so now I'm going to talk about the intuition of this partial identification uh, result. So. So basically, the idea is to reformulate this uh, extrapolation exercise into a linear program. So remember, we know the estimates like OLS, late, and also this cross moments, the expectation of indicator function uh, d equals to d is equal to z times y from the data. And uh, this estimates has an, two nice properties. So first, they are weighted average of MTE functions too. And secondly, the weights associated with for this estimate are also identifiable from the data. Okay, and uh, so that's why we call them IV-like estimates. And uh, remember, we also have shown that the ATs of always takers and ever takers are weighted average of MTE function. But what we don't know, as researcher, is that we don't know the functional form of MTE. But this IV-like estimate, say OLS, late, and cross moments, they actually provide some information with us on the possible parametric space of the MTE function. And uh, it is worth emphasizing that this cross moments actually provides the richest set of information on the functional form of MTE. And uh, the same MTE function actually generates this ATEs of always takers and never takers. And this implies that only a set of values of ATEs of all takers and ever takers are consistent with the information on a possible parametric space of MT function, which is constrained by this IV-like estimate. And uh, to conclude, we can then partially identify the ATEs of all takers and ever takers. To repeat, what I mean by partial identify is that we can, can construct a bound on the ATEs of all takers and ever takers. So, this intuition is summarized in this proposition. And uh, before I proceed, I would like to give two remarks on this proposition. So first, the sharpness of the bound is guaranteed in this proposition. So what I mean by sharpness is that given the assumptions in the data, that is given the constraints we, we, we put on the data in this, in this optimization uh, process, the bound you get is the tightest bound, shortest bound that you can get from the data. So this is guaranteed by the structure of the problem. And secondly, so this, if you compare this with many other um, partial identification uh, results, 
there is no analytical solution for the upper and lower bound from this proposition. So, so in that sense, it's not very transparent what drives the length of the bound because uh, for other partial identification results, you know what drives the length of the bound because you have analytical solutions on the upper and lower bound. So that's, I think, the weakness of this type of approach. So, so far we have talked about rephrasing the Inbens and Angus IV model into the latent tutorial framework and define the marginal treatment effect, MTE. And we also show that the ATs of always takers and never takers are weighted average of MTE. And we also show that if we put strong enough parametric assumptions on the MTE function, it guarantees point identification for our two target parameters. And uh, without invoking such parametric assumptions on the MTE function, we can still do partial identification by rephrasing everything into a linear programming problem. So now let's look at an application. So we now apply our methodology into this current Hamiller 2009 protein analysis paper. So in this current Hamiller paper, they are inter interested in the effect of watching Western Germans TV on the Eastern Germans support of communism. So the identification challenge is that, you know, the, this such type of uh, a media viewership uh, is suffers from the endogeneity problem. So people are self-selecting into the whether or not watch this news, uh, watch this media uh, products. And uh, to solve this selection endogeneity problem, their solution is to use a binary IV, which measures the access to the TV signal. The IV is set up as the following. The Z equals to one if the individual lives in the distant district. Uh, equals the z equals zero otherwise. So this Christian district is very far away from, pretty far away from the uh, Western, Western German and Western Europe, West Europe. And, uh, and uh, due to topological reasons, if you live in Christian district, it's very hard for you to, uh, to uh, receive the TV signal from the Western German. And uh, we argue that the self-selection in the selection stage suggests that people may anticipate they have private knowledge of potential treatment outcomes and therefore respond differently to our encouragement to, to this uh, to, 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 to the instrument. Again, uh, our we are trying to extrapolate to the ATEs of always takers and never takers. So before we talk about extrapolation exercise, uh, I will present the uh, uh, replication result of their paper. So this is the paper, the late estimates in the current Hamula paper. Uh, the point estimates are very close, by the way, uh, uh, but we we're using a little bit different sample in this, um, in this, in this table. And the instrument is very strong. Um, and uh, also we don't control anything in these regressions. So substantively speaking, the result shows that for compliers, uh, watching Western Germans TV actually increases people's support of communism. Uh, I think this is pretty interesting. Um, it's pretty striking to me actually. Um, and uh, now let's do some extrapolation exercise. So first let's talk about do this point, point extrapolation exercise. So because we have binary IV and we, if we assume that the MT function is linear, then you can point identify this MT function with binary IV. And then we can calculate everything from just by using sample moments. And then we, here are the extrapolation results. So the results shows that for always takers, the effect of Western Germans TV is positive for their support on the communism. And for the never takers, the effect is, the sign of the effect is reversed. I.e. for never takers, the effect of watching Western Germans TV on the support of communism is negative, okay? But again, people may not believe in our parametric assumptions. And I think the more interesting result is this uh, linear program from, from this linear program. So, so first let's look at the AT of always takers. So the bound for all, AT of always takers are always pretty wide. Uh, some of the bounds are even wider than the Mansky bound, right? So, and, uh, and uh, I think this is driven by the small sample problem for always takers because there are like 1.2, 1.6% of the observations are always takers in, in our data. So, but the result for never takers uh, are very informative after we control the age cohort in the linear program. Basically the bound only covers the negative side of the, 
interval. And uh, substantively speaking, this result shows that there is a negative effect of, the, of watching Western Germans TV on never takers support for communism. And our interpretation is that given never takers high support of communism, they're acting as if they have some private knowledge on this, on, on this potential treatment effect. Thus, they self-select to not consume the uh, Western Germans TV, even the, when they are given access to it. Okay, so to conclude, in this paper, uh, we're trying to use IV to learn the APs of always takers and never takers. So we first rephrase the Imbens and Angus IV model into the latent utility approach and define a new treatment effect parameter called uh, marginal treatment effect. And MT describes the ATE for the people who are at the margin of selecting the treatment. And we also show that the ATEs of always takers and never takers are weighted average of MTE. And uh, the extrapolation results shows that first, if we put parametric assumption on the MTE function, and then we can point and identify the MT, MTE function, and then we can identify our target parameters. And uh, if we don't want to invoke this parametric assumption, uh, we can reformulate this problem into a linear program, uh, linear optimization problem, and construct the bounds. And uh, in our application and simulation, we actually demonstrate that the linear program uh, is better than other competing existing partial identification approaches, say Mansky bounds, monotone treatment response bounds, uh, smoothness treatment response bounds, and the smoothness monotone treatment response bounds. Uh, in terms of better, what I mean is that you can construct a narrow bound, narrower bound without without invoking additional assumptions on the data. Okay, and uh, in our application, we'll apply our methodology to this current Hamura paper. So they are so we are they are, they are looking at the effect of Western Germans TV on the support of communism uh, for Eastern Germans, and uh, we find a negative effect of Western Germans TV. Um, people support for communism for never takers. The never takers, we, are, we interpret as uh, the never takers are acting as if they are having some private knowledge on the potential treatment effect and thus self select to not watch the Western Germans TV. And that's it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Arthur, for that presentation. At this point, uh, all our presenters are, uh, or both of our presenters, are available to take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. We've already had a few questions come in. <clears throat> so uh, Robert Gulati, who's actually uh, Arthur's co-author on this presentation, had a, a, a question for Matt, and it's the same question uh, that I was writing down as well when I was listening to that presentation. Um, so... Uh, for example, suppose you're asking coders to code something like media bias, and you give them a bunch of articles and you say, is this article biased or not? And you can imagine that uh, what's going to happen is um, people are going to interpret whether an article is biased through their ideological lens. And so there is an actual real bias parameter but people are not just making errors in coding it. They're actually systematically biased. And all the, let's say, all the uh, right-wing ideological uh, coders will code certain articles as being biased. So they'll, there'll be a lot of agreement there. All the left-wing um, coders will code different articles as being biased, and they will all agree with each other. And then, you know, I don't know, professors or something will code them correctly. I don't know. <laughs> Experts or something, super <laughs> predictors, I don't know. Um, so, so Robert's question was, could we incorporate something like bias in addition to competence in this model? And I'm thinking, especially for political science type coding questions, this is going to be really important. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So this is something I've, I've, uh, I've thought a lot about and... Uh, the the conclusion that I, I've come to here is that uh, uh, the the answer sort of depends on the population of coders you have at hand. So, um, so so to answer the sort of the last question first, uh, does this account for bias, uh, or can, can can any of these models account for bias? Uh, absolutely, uh, all the models I talk about in the paper that I recommend um, handle uh, like coder bias in in some way. 
so for example, in the coder competency estimation model that uh, I showed in I showed today, uh, the the bias is actually captured by the guessing parameter. So uh, guessing is just uh, sort of the name that the the original model uh, in computational linguistics had, uh, but it actually accounts for any sort of like tendency to uh, prefer stating one category so over over others. So, for example, if you have if you're worried about maybe some some democratic coders who are uh, constantly encountering pro democratic articles and just coding them as neutral because they that's the way their bias tells them to, to code to code those articles, uh, then that will manifest itself in terms of a of a guessing parameter that puts more weight on the neutral. They're, they're more likely to, to guess neutral, but that's really just their bias. So. That's accounted for, and, and in the uh, in the data in the, in the the data that I, I presented today, uh, that's exactly what uh, I find is that uh, almost all the coders that have some kind of party affiliation uh, are less likely to guess their own their own side's category, and more likely to to guess that the article is neutral. Um, so in that sense, yeah, bias is accounted for. Uh, in another sense, bias is not accounted for. So, for example, if all your coders, so if you don't have enough coders to get a, a wide uh, set of views, uh, then then what bias means is is it's difficult to define what bias means there, and it's certainly probably not what we mean when we think of bias because sort of the the group's average or the the average group think uh, of your coders is is biased. So you can't adjust for bias uh, that uh, or you. You can't move your coders away from from their average, basically. Mm -hmm. So if if your coders are just naturally inclined to think that these all these articles or all your coders are biased right wing, uh, then then you can't account for that bias. But if you have a wide set of views, and and this is consistent with what people find in the crowdsourcing literature, if you have a wide set of views, you're more likely to be able to account for uh, for sort of group level biases. Uh, so a question came in from uh, Xiao Lu. Um, Thanks both to Arthur and Matt for the great presentation. I'm gonna. Uh, he has questions for uh, for both, um, but I'm gonna skip to the question for Arthur. Um, if I can find it. <laughs> oh well, I don't see it quite. Oh, I'm still typing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, um, in that case, I'm going to go to a question from Santiago Lopez Carboni for Arthur. Uh, can you say something about the implications of your proposal for other contexts where um, instrumental variables uh, are used, such as fuzzy RDD and fuzzy diff and diff? Can I respond now? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I think that's a great question. So um, I'm not aware of uh, the the application of this method on fuzzy, R fuzzy diff and diff. But for fuzzy RDD, uh, it turns out that you can still define the marginal treatment effect given the running variable at the threshold. And, uh, and uh, there is actually a paper, uh, it's still a working paper. Uh, they, they, they should, should, the author, Dong Yi from UCE, I think Riverside, she has a paper that in the fuzzy RDD setting, you can still identify the MT function given the, uh, the the running variable. So I think that's my response. Uh, yeah. Um, so a question for uh, uh, Matt from uh, Andres Baranski. Uh, thanks for your interesting presentation. It's very useful for my current research on coding communication and experimental legislative bargaining games. There's something I don't have clear. If there are only two coders, it is always true when one coder, it is always true that when one coder is the majority, so is the other one. Uh, in this case, how can one way based on competency to make predictions, both coders will be equally accurate, so there's no tiebreaker. For your model, do we always need more than two coders? Uh, so for the, the CCE model, the coder competency estimation model that I, I showed in the slides, the, the minimum known coverage you need is, is three to, to identify the model. And, and, I, and I talk about that in the paper. And, and generally, all the coding models, um, all, the, all the basic coding models require at least three coders because you need, um, you need some way to, uh, as the, the question suggests, you need some way to identify uh, what, are, what are maybe the good majorities and the bad majorities. Um, the the only thing you can really get from two coders is is capturing uncertainty. So you yes, uh, as the question suggests, you have to assume when there's only two coders that both coders are equally accurate or homogeneous. 
or at least that the differences are very small. Uh, and then the only thing that predictions will buy you is that uh, we're uncertain given only one noisy signal about the true label. Yeah. So still useful, but not as useful as when you have multiple coders and you can estimate all their competencies. Uh, uh, so the question from Xiao Lu for Arthur. Uh, I have some difficulty in understanding your causal quantity. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me for always takers, only uh, Y1 is well-defined as at a population level, they, were never, they will never take the treatment at all. I understand you extrapolate the MTE a little bit via some continuity assumptions, and that's cool. But could you help me a little bit on how I can interpret the concept of ATE for always takers in your context? So I think that's a very good question. Um, so I have, uh, I think I have uh, three responses. So first, uh, even you are uh, always taker, never taker, the potential outcomes you can still you, you can still define potential outcomes, right? So, and uh, and secondly, so remember that each IV in the late frame in, in the late framework, each IV is associated with different compliance types. So 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 for example, uh, in IVZ1, I may be the complier, but in IVZ2, uh, I may be never taker or always taker. And the response three, so this type of work, the, like result is especially useful when you are trying to expand some of the existing, uh, say conditional cash transfer, this type of policy programs. And uh, some people, substantially speaking, the, the reason that they became never takers is because your inducement, your encouragement in the first stage is not strong enough. And sometimes people may say, oh, what if we give even stronger enough uh, 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 encouragement for these never takers and then they may take the treatment. That's by construction of that latent that has selection equation, right? So, and uh, then we can, I, I, I think the never takers, the treatment effect for the never takers are especially useful in this type of setup when you are trying to expand your program to never takers by, by increasing your incentives uh, to these people. Yeah, I think I answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, we're actually a little bit over time, so I'd like to uh, thank everyone uh, for participating in this week's IMC, uh, particularly Matthew and, and Arthur for being our presenters and Matt for being a repeat customer. Uh, other presentations will be uh, posted to our website shortly after this broadcast if you'd like to share them with a colleague or watch them again later. I also want to invite you to join us uh, next Friday, uh, May 29th, when we will host a talk entitled Keyword Assisted Topic Models by Tomoya Sasaki of MIT and Shushe Ishima of Harvard. Uh, uh, Kosuke Amai is also a co-author, but I don't think he's going to be presenting. Uh, we'll also have another talk uh, entitled GPIRT, a Gaussian process model for item response theory by J.B. Duckmayer, Roman Garnett, and Jacob Montgomery, all of whom are from uh, WashU and St. Louis. Please see our website, methods-colloquium.com, to get more information about these talks. Thanks for being here, guys, and uh, I hope to see you next week, and stay safe. Thanks for having us.